free and clear of the chatter from Wall Street, you're listening to Talking Stocks Over Beer, hosted by hedge fund veteran and newsletter writer Mike Alkin, who helps ordinary investors level the playing field against the pros by bringing you market insights and interviews with corporate executives and institutional investors. Mike sifts through all the noise of mainstream financial media and Wall Street to help you focus on what really matters in the markets. And now, here is your host, Mike Alkin. It's Tuesday, July 9th, 2019. Hope you had a good 4th of July weekend and enjoyed yourself wherever you were. And for our Canadian friends, I hope you had a good Canada day. I just kind of decided last week I was just going to uh, recharge a little bit. And uh, my my uh, family and I, we went to um, to the Jersey Shore, went down to Long Beach Island, in an area called Beach Haven, which is, uh, I know for those of you who watch TV and you think of the Jersey Shore, you think of a lot of a lot of folks in uh, big hair uh, and uh, and uh, uh, tank top tank top t- tank top t-shirts, uh, but uh, it's, it's it's really it's not like that at all. It's really it's really nice. It's relaxing. Although it has the hottest sand I've ever seen in my life. I've been on a lot of beaches and this sand is crazy. Like from the walk from when you hit the sand to where the water is, I don't know, maybe it's two three hundred feet, and you should see me doing like a, a polka dance across the sand because I'm, apparently my wife tells me I'm a baby and I can't handle the sand. But, but it, it really is. It's it's. I mean, I've been in the tropics. I've been every, a lot of beaches, and it's it's nothing like this. So I got to look that up as to what causes the sand to be so damn hot in on the Jersey Shore. Uh, and I you know I grew up on Long Island, so 75 miles away, never had an issue at all. It was cool sand, so so it was hot sand. But anyway, it was uh, kids had a lot of fun and. Uh, there were a few, you know, few families there and a lot of kids. And, uh, you know, it's just great to watch them at, the, at when they're teenage years to, to, to just have their friends around and, and do all that stuff. And, and, uh, but I learned something. I, I, it, it was fortified for me this week that, that, uh, my wife is smarter than ways. Um, well, that's what she tells me. Um, so I have, I, I, I am a firm believer in, uh, in ways I trust. Uh, we have, you know, my son and I uh, travel a fair amount for his lacrosse in the summer on the travel team and the tournaments, and there's, you go all over the place. And uh, so we're in the car a fair amount uh, on the weekends. And um, Waze has gotten me out of some incredible traffic jams through side streets and back alleys and Lord knows where, but sure enough, it, it saves time. And uh, so I have really followed that motto in ways I trust. I, my wife, on the other hand, every time we're in the car and I have ways on, because um, I, I, I can't figure out the, the whole infotainment stuff. I, I could barely, you know, on a computer, I, I know how to use the internet and, and email and a, and a spreadsheet. Um, <clears throat> so I don't even bother with the other stuff. So I'm, I, I'm fine with ways, works well for me. Um, and, uh, but every time we're in the car, every time we're in the car, and I have ways on, she says, you know, I, I wouldn't go that way. I said, well, I, yeah, I know, but she said, but yeah, but I'm telling you, I, I wouldn't, I go this way. And I said, no, I appreciate that, but see, like here, it shows that you know this shows one. Well, let's pull up three alternative routes, and this this is not any of the three that you want to go, and this is telling us the time. And she says, yeah, but but it doesn't know. I'm telling you, and when I do that. And I used to do that early on uh, when I first started using Waze. I would always try and trick, you know, go around it, and it never worked. Uh, it always took longer. My wife, every time, tells me, and she's right every time. So I decided that uh, when she's in the car, from now on, I'm just in my wife I trust. No longer Waze I trust. Um, so... Uh, I don't know how she does it, but she's clairvoyant when it comes to traffic. Uh, if I could figure out how to patent it, I would, but I, I don't know that I can. Uh, but besides that, anyway, uh, you know you live in the northeast of the U.S. when it takes you uh, four hours and four and a half hours to go 70 miles. Um, it's just kind of how it works. Uh, to to where I live in Long Island, to get off of the island is an hour and a half. And it should take, without traffic, uh, 
uh, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, so there you have it. Anyway, uh, you know, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I guess, uh, when I started uh, with, uh, my conversation, well, I was talking a lot about energy and I gave out an outline. And, uh, you know, as, as my career has morphed over the years, I think I mentioned, or if I didn't mention, I meant to mention it, but, but, um, you know, I've really dr drilled down, no pun intended, um, uh, into the energy sector. And, um, you know, early on when you start out as a, as a young analyst, you, you are, if you're depending on the firm you're at, but I was a, I was a generalist investor, uh, really my first, I was a short seller. Uh, I worked at a short only firm. Uh, and so it was, uh, it had two funds. One was a long short fund and the other was a short only fund. And I had my focus on the short side. So I did a lot of deep dive fundamental research across myriad industries where I really spent a lot of my time early on was in the for-profit education space. And it was, it was there that, um, bet this is going back into the mid middle latter part of the nineties where, um, the for-profit education companies were uh, following really the growth of Title IV, which is the federal funding. Uh, and uh, and that's continued to today. Uh, you see tuitions increase because the av available monies uh, from, from the government increase. So, you know, the university folks just keep bumping it up. Uh, but then you had these, and still do, you have these public companies that became uh, 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 huge growth vehicles because they – you know, the internet was just really starting up and you were able to do marketing on the internet. And even before the market, I did telemarketing and they would target those first generation to go to college and lower income students. And they would uh, sell them uh, on, on the dreams of getting a college degree. But this was for, 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 for profit schools that had no brand that uh, in theory, it worked great. You would provide access to an education to those who couldn't, wouldn't normally have known about it. And you went out and told them about it. But the problem was the education sucked. Um, uh, and they, and many of them, not all, but many of them were full of crap on the enrollment process. And I, I learned early on, I went through the enrollment process as a potential student. And from there, we started doing our primary research and talking to former students or students in parking lots, then former students who told us how they they weren't getting, uh, former students said they, they withdrew from classes, but the loans weren't being, uh, uh, they weren't getting refunds on monies. And it was, it was one thing led to another. You talk to con congressional staffers, you talk to the education department, and it was a great way to learn how they do a mosaic of research. And how not one, not any one thing is what makes an investment work. And you have to put it all together. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle and just looking for different pieces and weighing the, the evidence, if you will. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's, that's the science of it. And the art of it is trying to figure out how to make money. What do you do with that stuff and trying to find catalysts and what causes the stock price to go down, but a great, great experience in, in doing what's called primary field research in, in, in newsletter land, they call it, uh, boots on the ground. Um, it's, it's primary research. <clears throat> so, and then that was that industry. And then, uh, um, I, I started to look at other industries and, uh, you know, if you think of all the industries in the world, there's a lot, right. But, uh, you don't know when you first start out, what's natural to you, what's comfortable to you. I remember reading a book when I first started, uh, 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 some years, maybe some years later, but Peter Lynch went up on wall street and it's by what you know. And it was always like his, his thing was, you know, a lot of consumer stuff. <clears throat> and, um, uh, I don't necessarily agree with that, uh, but I think it helps to understand what you know. Um, and, but more importantly, what doesn't make intuitive sense to you when you're looking at an industry and, and over the years, you know, when you first start out, you'll, you, 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 you spend a hundred hours a week. We used to work 90, a hundred hours a week. <clears throat> it was nonstop and the travel and you're always studying a new industry and trying to get up to speed. And, and um, some made much more sense to me than others. And over the years, as you become more senior in the industry, you start to say, okay, when you start to control what, what stocks you're going to pick and not just analyzing them, <clears throat> well, then that's very easy to cull those industries that mo don't make sense. And as 
you know, you look at it, there's, there's healthcare, there's energy, there's materials, there's consumer cyclicals, you know, autos, um, uh, retail, cyclical retail businesses, there's staples, there's food, drug, beverage, tobacco, there's the financial stocks, there's the drug stocks, there's the biotech stocks, right? You could go on and on and on. So for me, it was pretty easy. I, I mean, it was kind of intuitive. The, the big financial center banks, the money center banks, they're so opaque. And, and, and there were so many moving parts. Oop, check off that list. Um, uh, biotech companies. I worked with I worked with a couple of uh, just incredibly bright uh, doctors, MBAs turned biotech analysts, and uh, looking at phase one, phase two, phase three drug studies. And as brilliant as they were, a lot of times it was a crapshoot. <clears throat> so, I, I, you know, I uh, the one thing I've learned is about know what you don't know. And I realized, okay, pff, forget biotech. Uh, and, um, so, uh, that didn't, um, so I kind of checked that off the list. And then as I went on and on and on, what I kind of, the core of my career, the, the middle part of my career in the sweet spot was spent in a lot of the time in, in the more consumer driven names, uh, consumer cyclicals and consumer, um, uh, products, the defensive type names, um, you know, food, drug, beverage, tobacco. And that, that kind of always has made sense for me, um, which was, uh, it's driven by price, volume, and mix, right? That's how the revenue is derived. What's the price of something? How much are you selling of something? And are you selling higher mix being, you know, you, know, you have different tiers. You have a value brand, a mid-tier brand, a high brand. And that, when you're looking at revenue forecasts, uh, you know, the, right? Because stocks move based on the anticipated direction of their their earnings. And uh, what, what um there's forecasts. So what, you know, there's consensus. If, if a company X is supposed to move 5%, uh, top line growth and earnings are going to grow eight, nine, 10% pick a number. I'm making it up. Okay. Well, let's, let's understand that we've got to analyze this company. So what is that 5%? How is that derived? How much of that move is going to be driven by a price increase, right? Cause the, the thing you'd love to see as a, as an investor is price increases, because if I, if I can, change the price one percentage point, um, all I have to do is have my sales guys go out and negotiate it and, and it moves. It's a point. If I, if I get a point of sales growth and not from price, but from volume, I've got to make more stuff. I've got to buy more raw materials. I've got to consume more working capital. It's just a lot more work. So my margins are going to be better. My profit margins on a point of growth from price versus a point of growth from volume. And then the mix is, there, are there new products? Are there new, um, is there a new product cycle coming that's going to lead to higher products or lo uh, higher price products or lower price products? Is there a competition coming in on the low end? Does the company need to defend that comp that because they need to own that portion of the market? All of that stuff goes into it, but you go out into the field and you can find all that stuff. You talk to customers and suppliers and distributors and and understand it because consensus is consensus. I mean, it's 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 the herd, and so it's not always right. And you know, markets are not efficient, and sometimes things get mispriced. So that's what you did. But I, I that that was intuitive to me. That that made sense. Geez, I can understand. I eat food. I drink beer. Right. I I. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, I consume a lot of those products and the same thing on the cyclical side of, of those. And so, so as, as time went on in my career, I spent a lot of time there. And then also I, uh, uh, uh was at two firms that had a very big, uh, energy and natural gas and, um, natural resource, uh, uh exposure. So I got great exposure to that. And it was during that, <laughs> where I started to see, and as my career has morphed and the hedge fund industry has grown, what I started to see was, you know, where do you generate, where can you generate really good amounts of alpha? And that's, you know, performance above the, the, the benchmark. <clears throat> and in the hedge fund industry, it became uh, more and more difficult and still is to this day as uh, the hedge funds have grown in numbers from, you know, when I started probably less than you know, there were several hundred. Now there's over 10,000. <clears> and the economics of running a hedge fund can be lucrative. Um, 
when I started, they were making, um, you know, one percent of of the assets. They would charge a management fee, and they would keep twenty percent of the profits. Uh, and back then, in the '90s, most of the investors in hedge funds were really ultra high net worth individuals. Um, but uh, um, and and there was a lot of volatility in the funds, and that but you saw great performance. And one of the things you saw was not a lot of institutional investors. So high net worth individuals, they would a hedge fund manager would would know them. They'd talk to them, and they would say, "Here's here, look, here's what we do." And and once a quarter, maybe once every six months, maybe, and but definitely once a year, you would send out your letter. Here's Here's how we're thinking about the market. Here's how we're thinking about certain sectors. Here's how uh, some of a, a couple of the ideas that we like. It might have been a, an idea about an industry, an idea about a company, but you didn't tell them much secretive because it was your proprietary research. And <clears throat> what you knew from doing that, and I didn't know it at the time. And looking back now, you realize it. But but you didn't put out monthly performance numbers. You you didn't have to worry how you did month to month. And what you realize is to put up performance well ahead of the, the consensus or the benchmark or to generate alpha, you can't be doing the same thing as everyone else. Well, by de definition, if you're doing the same thing as consensus, it takes a while for a consensus to come around to that, to, to be surprised that they're not correct, right? And consensus isn't typically done by that field research. Right. The way it typically works is consensus is formed by uh, on the sell side, <clears throat> the big investment banks, through talking to management teams. And management teams are in the business of telling you how great things are, not how how challenging things are. And and those and those analysts back then and still today, but much much but less so, um, the analysts aren't in the business of coming out and putting negative reports out on companies. Some do, right? It's not all, but most most don't. Why? Because there's relationships to be had. There's investment banking fees to be had. And even though today in a, in a research analyst can't get paid based on the investment banking side of the business, there's that wall that's there. They're not stupid if, if they're very negative on an industry and their bankers can't go in and get those big juicy fees because the CFO and CEO are pissed off at them. They're not going to have a job. Right? They may not get compensated for it, but they don't want to give up that, that, that half a million dollar a year job or, or more. Right? They're not giving that up. So, but you realize that um, uh, what, but there was less investment uh, over, not oversight, there was less investment eyeballs uh, from the institute. There were no institutions really, or there were some, but most of your investors were high net worth folks. They put the money with you and they didn't mind the volatility, right? Every three months you'd, or six months, you told them what your performance was. And at the end of the year, hopefully, you, not always, but hopefully you outperformed, but you weren't under the microscope. Fast forward to the uh, to the internet bubble, and the world fell apart. Well, hedge funds had a lot of short exposure, and they outperformed dramatically. And then that brought in the institutional crowd, who were who got hammered during the internet bubble, because a lot of the fund managers in the, in their world own own, own that garbage. Uh, where you know, remember back in the day, where companies were valued based on a number of eyeballs that viewed a company, right? <clears throat> so. Um, if you were an internet company, um, but that brought a lot of institutional interest and uh, a lot of demand for hedge funds. And when the institutions came in, you know, right, they, it's all about box checking and covering their ass CYA. So if they're going to allocate large sums of capital instead of a you know high net worth guy giving you one million, five million, something like that into a hedge fund, now these big institutions, the pension plans, the fund of funds, who aggregate uh, endowment money and, and and pension plan money and go out and and invest on behalf of those those entities, you know. Now now they could give you 25, 50, 100, 200 million and more. Um, well, they're going to make sure that they do their due diligence on all the fund managers, and that became a cottage industry, and then a big industry. Uh, but but when that comes though, uh, and then because it was in demand, because it was in demand, the the fees went up. So now all of a sudden, a hedge fund manager would charge, it would go to one and a quarter, one and a half, then two percent of the assets under management. And then that you know, they still keep their 20% of the profit. So now, all of a sudden, a fund starts running a few billion dollars. You know, all of a sudden, you're running three billion dollars, <throat> and your, you know, your 2% management fee on three billion dollars is 60 million dollars. Well, you know, I don't do the math. You have seven, eight, ten, twelve analysts. <clears throat> all of a sudden, the hedge fund managers are getting very wealthy.
then if you they outperform, they get 20% of the profits. If you're up 10% on 3 billion, uh, that's 300 million. They keep 20%. That's 60 million. So that, enter, that enterprise between the management fee and the other just made 120 million dollars. It's a lot of wealth to go around. <clears throat> so that created hedge fund managers, smart guys. Okay, well, I'm growing my asset base. I've got a very nice steady income stream, uh, and I keep getting bigger and bigger. And and they, by the way, they didn't get to one billion, two billion, three billion by not being super smart and putting up great returns earlier. Um, uh, during during the times where there was less of that that institutional dollars, so they earn their stripes. Then they get to that point, and they don't want to give up those management fees, so they're less willing to take a little bit of risk. Uh, and then you have this uh, this these box checkers who come in and, and their financial theory and their portfolio management theory, and they have due diligence questionnaires that could be forty pages, and they want to know your performance on a monthly basis. And again, you're trying to outperform, and it's hard to outperform on a monthly basis. It just doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so um, it, it, it's your work over time that has a variant view. You have a variant perception, and it p plays out over time. Well, that sounds great in theory, but most investors don't have that patience. And the institutions are all uh, competing against each other, and there's pressure to perform. And the guy who made that decision, who's a uh, 28 year old out of school. He doesn't want to look like an idiot and they got to go to investment committees. It's bureaucracy like you can't imagine. And so the more and more that goes on, the more the assets trillions now uh, flow into the hedge fund business. And this started happening early 2000s and mid 2000s. You saw this massive growth. And, uh, and but you start to see uh, performance start to get watered down. Why? Because they're not doing the things that they did to get them there. And why? Because they are making so much money, they're not going to. And and why do the institutions then that invest in the hedge fund stick around? Because you never know when a 2008 is going to come around and the world's going to blow up again and there's short exposure at the hedge funds. And so uh, when, the, when the market gets pounded down 40%, the hedge funds down 10, down 12, down 15, up a little bit, whatever it may be. When you're down 40, you get up, you got to be up a lot more than 40 to, to make up the difference. That's just math. So, so they, they put up with that because a regular long only manager doesn't have it. They don't have that exposure. Uh, but, but during all that, what I started to see, and, and as you know, you get into 2010, 11, 12, and being around natural resources and energy, what I realized was, <clears throat> so you have this whole pool of people focusing on, on these sectors and natural resources oil and gas, yes, but natural resources tend to, you know, they're boom and bust. And what I started to realize as my career morphed and morphed and morphed was, uh, despite all the quantitative models and all the quants getting into the business, and despite all of uh, <clears throat> the uber smart people, not you know, uber the car company, but uber meaning very smart people that do this for a living. And I will tell you, you know, when you're, when you're sitting around an institution and you're talking, I mean, the thing you have is you have people who understand the world. They don't just understand what, what the town they live in, the city they live in. They don't just understand the business they're in. They're looking at industries all over the world. They're talking to CEOs all over the world. And you get great exposure. And if you're a curious person, guy or gal, uh, the world's your oyster to take advantage of, of, of the knowledge that you could glean from it. So, so you – but one of the things with all of that, all that stuff – all that noise. What I realized, it it comes it it's it's human emotion, um, and um, it, it's hard to you know you do have those surprises um, in in all these other industries and a stock misses or beats earnings expectations and uh, you get into stocks go up 10, 20, 30 percent whatever it is. But one of the things I realized is is in in the cyclical commodity businesses. <clears throat> You know, there are long drawn out capital intensive cycles and there's this recency bias that occurs. And um, and so whatever recently just happened is how consensus tends to form and extrapolate into the future. And forecasting is hard. And especially depending on what it is, like oil and gas or so many moving parts. Um, and, and the right. So the more transparency there is, you've got more people following it. But uh, you tend to see. 
uh, with long life projects, you know, I, I, I talked before about uh, what, what I see happening in the shale right now, you know, the shale plays uh, where, and this is not about shale, but I see the, I see all of this capital being uh, because of ZERP, zero interest rate policy and, and, and Fed, poly, you know, monetary experiment of the last decade. Uh, capital is seeking higher yields and those higher yields come in the form of junk bonds and that went to find that goes to finance a lot of the shale plays and over the, what we've seen over the last decade is is you know, more than two thirds don't lose money a couple hundred billion dollars in free cash flow uh, down the drain um, a lot of debt racked up debt coming due and uh, but uh, it, it, it attracts it and but in, in the interim you've had all these so so all uh, a lot of the drilling and exploration and spending has taken place in the shale plays. And what's what's been left for dead is the offshore stuff, and that's still a third of the world oil, maybe a little bit less, comes from comes from the offshore fields. But all these projects have been put on the shelf, and then all of a sudden, uh, when 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 you start to see the changes, now you've seen institutional investors really start to demand uh, capital discipline and shareholder returns versus production growth in the shale plays, and all of a sudden maybe you start to see production growth slow. And now they need the world needs to come up with uh, with a lot of oil uh, and, and uh, every day. So where do they get that? Oh, now they're gonna then then they turn back to the to the offshore plays, and all of a sudden you've said, well, wait a second, nobody cared about offshore. There's been this lack of spending. There's not enough supply. They're gonna have to go and spend a lot. All of a sudden you see the money come pouring back in. It's like a huge seesaw, and you see that in the natural resource in in the oil and gas markets and it's deeply cyclical commodity markets. It's human nature, boom and bust. And I love that. So my focus, as I've morphed and as I've, you know, matured, my wife would probably disagree about my maturity level. But but what I would say is um, it's, you know, the consumer stuff is always interesting to me and I keep my eye on it because it's just something I've known and done for a long time. But but in the in the in the deeply cyclical industries, you can learn so much and and that's where you know my interest the last half a decade has really morphed into the energy space and you know energy is not just any other ingredient in economic growth it's the irreplaceable ingredient that makes that growth possible i mean think about that energy is everything it powers everything it makes all this economic growth possible and so that and and when you combine that with some of the overshoots on both sides to the upside and downside that you see, it creates investment opportunities that don't exist in looking at regular companies that have more secular growth, not, not cyclical growth. And this applies to other cyclical industries, be it, be it auto or steel, right? I mean, any, anything like that, but that's deeply cyclical prone to real low lows and real high highs. Now, the hard part is getting that timing right, right? So you're looking for um, inflection points and inflection points can take a while. It takes a while for the market to get their head around it. It takes a while for supply, if it's an oversupplied situation for supply to come out of the market and for the for it to be felt at uh, on the demand side and the pricing. So yeah, these so these low rates create this environment and you get the boom bust cycle and right all this offshore stuff has been put off. But this isn't about offshore oil and gas, not about shale, but it's about examples of how the cycles lend themselves to deep 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 overshoots one way or the other. <clears throat> and I and I see it throughout the energy complex and and there's so much that I see, obviously, as at, at Sachem Cove and, and running a uranium fund. We have to know everything about the, uh, the global energy space, and, and that's been a, a major area of emphasis for, for many years now. Um, and, you know, you've heard me talk about uh, la uh, two weeks ago, we we're going to talk about how this all fits together. And I started talking about the geopolitics and um, – uh, you know, it's it's something that I have paid a lot of it for many years, many many years. But uh, really, really pay close attention to it because it is so intertwined. And and given how, you know, if you you may or may not believe my view, but energy really is the source of, of everything. And when it comes to growth, it's so important. Um, uh, I was I was just reading in one of the African countries that uh, in Ethiopia they have to have energy rations now because they can't um, uh, right. So they're rationing energy. Right. Think about that with what that does if, if you're trying to get an economy growing. Um, 
But, you know, it goes way back. I mean, if you think about how energy and and the uh, geopolitics geopolitics are intertwined, you, know, you go back to, uh, I remember I was reading a story, it goes back to talking about uh, in, in February of 45, uh, how the USS Murphy traveled from Jeddah, uh, where it had picked up King Abdulaziz, who was the founder of Saudi Arabia, and it went uh, and rendezvoused with the USS Quincy in the Great Bitter Lake, which was part of the Suez Canal, is part of the Suez Canal. And on board, uh, uh, the king met with Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, for the first and, and really only time. And they spent a whole afternoon, they had a bunch of discussion, they were focusing on Palestine was kind of the key thing that they were talking about. But they forged a relationship during this day. And that relationship evolved into a deal that really sat at the heart of really late 20th century geopolitics. And, and what that deal was, was the exchange of American security assistance for access to Saudi Arabian oil. It pissed off Churchill, by the way, because he came late to the party. Um, uh, but, you know, if you think about oil, it had it, been World War II's indispensable commodity. And it was equally as, as critical to rebuilding the post-war economies. And, and the effort that Roosevelt put into King Abdulaziz and, and building that relationship reflected the growing globalization of its supply. Now, during the war, I mean, America had provided the mass, vast majority of the oil that fed the war machine, but then production began to shift to the Middle East and exploration intensified after all these war year restrictions were lifted. Now, Gawar, which is Saudi Arabia's crown jewel and still produces close to 4 million barrels a day, which really was a secret. Everyone thought it produced 5 million barrels a day until they issued a bond not too long ago and they had to come out and say what it was. But, but that was discovered in 48 and then production started three years later. And then the U.S. leadership, which drove the war machine, really started to disintegrate and erode when OPEC was formed, which was back then in the 60s. Right, 1960, I think it was formed. You had Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela. And then you had kind of by the peak of oil production uh, in, in, in uh, 1970 in the U.S. is oil production until now. But really OPEC's effort to entrench its market dominance led to the oil embargo in 1973. If you're in the U.S. and you're old enough to remember, you had high prices, long lines of cars at the U.S. gas pumps. You had this oil price-induced recession in the West. And really it was the end of the, the era in which the U.S. and the major private oil companies who were called the Seven Sisters could really set the rules for global oil markets. It was over. All right, so what you know, Henry Kissinger said, the energy crisis awakened us to a new challenge that would require both critical creative thinking and international cooperation in order to preserve and further our collective well-being. Former Secretary of State. And Kissinger is the one who pushed for the establishment of the IEA, the International Energy Agency in 74. And that was really as a club for energy importers to, to balance the negotiating power of the exporters. And they put it together really quickly. It had wide-ranging powers. It had a governing board. They could make decisions that would be binding for its member countries. But so much of what happens uh, is based upon geopolitics. I remember reading a good interview. I think it was in the Atlanta Council last year. And it was uh, a speech that Richard Morningstar, Ambassador Richard Morningstar, was the chairman of the Atlanta Council Global Energy Center, uh, a talk he gave uh, to uh, uh, in the lecture series in Woodhull, Massachusetts. And he says, I'd like to focus on the intersection of energy and geopolitics. When one looks at energy issues, whether it be the behavior of oil markets, commercial energy projects, or new transformative technologies relating to addressing climate change, geopolitics and national security play a role. 
There are obviously other issues that intersect, such as legal, commercial, economic, and environmental issues. But any energy project has to be commercially viable, but that viability is often affected by geopolitics. Then he gave a great example, and he, he touched on the oil markets, because that's where the intersection with geopolitics is most obvious. Because right? if you have disruptions of supply from Libya, Nigeria, Venezuela, or the imposition of sanctions on, on countries like Iran, they, they, they're going to have an obvious effect on global supply, the price, how major producers such as Saudi and Russia and now the U.S. react to these disruptions. And he gave a great example of, and he went back to the mid-90s where he was a special advisor to the president. And he was responsible for all the programs in the former Soviet Union. And he said that at some point it became obvious that the energy resources in the Caspian Sea were becoming an important issue. And for a while there had been bipartisan support for the Caspian policy from the 90s, which continue, continues really up till today, which, which focuses now on the Caspian gas going to Europe. But what he said was going back to the 90s from a policy standpoint, the administration felt that the Caspian oil was important to offer new alternatives in supply. And they felt it was important that not all pipelines from the region go through Russia. And they wanted to support the independence of new countries in the Caucasus and Central Asia. And so he got involved. He approached Strobe Talbert, who was then Deputy Secretary of State, and told him they needed one person to focus on coordinating all these issues. And Strobe said to him, okay, well, that's you. He said, me? He said, yeah. But that's how he got involved in the creation of the major oil pipeline from Baku through Azerbaijan. Georgia and, and onto the southwestern coast of Turkey. And, and they strongly supported that route. He said there were three other alternatives from the Caspian, through Iran, through Russia, and the third to the Georgian coast onto the Black Sea and through the Bosporus. Now here's where the geopolitics come in. The U.S. was not going to allow a pipeline through Iran because of sanctions at the time. And then further, he said, why would, why would you want new oil going through Iran subject to Iranian whims and regarding the Straits of Hormuz? And regarding Russia, he said even the companies recognized there were already enough pipelines going through Russia. And they, furthermore, they, everyone was stressing the independence of these new countries. And then turning to the Bosporus, Turkey wasn't going to allow any more large tankers through. And if you've ever been to Istanbul and you see how narrow the straits are, you can understand why. So that really only left Baku, Tbilisi, and Sehan. But companies argued that the cheapest route was through Georgia and then now through the Bosporus. And he said he remembered meeting at the White House where they were explaining the position. And one of the companies argued that they had to let them go through Supsa on the Black Sea and then through the Bosporus because it was the lowest cost. But what Morningstar argued was that, that was irrelevant because Turkey wasn't going to let it happen. And if they wanted to get the oil out of the Caspian, it had to go through the BTC. And he said everyone was grumbling. And, but ultimately, they came to an agreement. He said, you know, you have to recognize that the project as a policymaker needs to be commercially viable. And they worked with Turkey to guarantee the cost of the pipeline wouldn't ex exceed a certain amount and so on and so forth. And then he fast forwards to today. He says, you know, a more recent example is the intersection of energy and geopolitics is what's the controversy that's surrounding the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And that's the pipeline that would carry gas from Russia under the Baltic directly into Germany and into Europe. Uh, you've heard Trump rail about the pipeline and all the money Germany pays Russia for gas. And he uses that point to question why the U.S. should support NATO and defend Europe. And, I mean, Nord Stream 2 is a real issue. And the real reasons for which the Obama administration, most of the Trump administration, are opposing it is that it just increases European dependence on Russian gas. And you've heard me talk about uranium and, and, but, and, and dependence on Russia, Kazakhstan, but... But Russia has used a political tool to deprive Ukraine of transit fees on existing routes. They could shut off the natural gas at any time. Morningstar argues it sends a terrible signal given the Russians' actions in the Crimea and in eastern Ukraine, Poland, other Central European countries strongly oppose it. But he said many in Europe support the pipeline, saying its commercial project and geopolitics shouldn't be a consideration, although Merkel has recognized that it does play some role. So there you have it. It's a commercial issue or a geopolitical issue. What takes precedence? Some in Europe say, why is it any of the U.S.'s business? 
the U.S. argues it is because energy security relates directly to economic security and political security, which is clearly in our interest anywhere. There are all these things that get involved. It's all in the papers every day. You just got to pay attention to it because it ultimately does does affect. You know, it, it ultimately does come down to, to energy. And that's why I like from an investor standpoint, why I find the energy sector so interesting is the boom and bust cycles and how you really it can lend itself to these just dramatic, dramatic um, swings in prices. So if you're going back to that hedge fund, you're trying to eke out those those regular returns and you're you now you've gotten bigger, you've got a few billion dollars. And uh, you're buying now because you're so big, you have to buy a lot of the mainstream companies and your performance is somewhat struggling. And during the last 10 years, it's been a very difficult because you have short exposure. You're not fully exposed to the market. So you're going to underperform and you've seen this massive increase in passive investing and you're fighting it out. That's why I find the energy markets in this, particularly those markets that have been so left for dead, so interesting. And that has been something that's been very very interesting for me to to explore over the years and to find opportunities that really are just uh, hiding in plain sight. You just have to look. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I spent time with and, you know, we think about world energy investment. And again, this is all public stuff. The International Energy Association agency. It's fantastic, the information you can get from there. How does this stuff get, it all comes down to money. How does this stuff get financed? Right? In 2018, the global energy investment stabilized. It was $1.8 trillion. Now that was after three years of a mild decline. This is going to surprise you. There was more spending on oil and gas and coal supply. Power attracted the most investment. China by far was the largest market for energy investment in 2018, but that's narrowing. The U.S. and India have increased the most over the past three years. What you're seeing in, in trends in energy spending and supply side spending is it's shifted a lot towards projects with much shorter lead times, which is really a reflection of investors demanding better capital management really during periods of a lot of uncertainty about the direction of the energy system. Renewable, obviously no supply. <clears throat> Adjusting for the price declines in renewable is up about 55% since 2010. But the interesting thing, what you see when you look at it is today's investment trends are misaligned with where the world appears to be heading sustainable energy. Interestingly, approvals of new conventional oil and gas projects fall way short of what would be needed to meet the continued robust demand growth. There's hardly any signs in the EIA data of a major reallocation of capital that's required to bring investment in line with the Paris Agreement, and all these other sustainable development goals. Even as you see costs fall in some areas, investment activity in low carbon supply and demand is stalling. And it's stalling because insufficient policy focus to address all the capital risks. In the sustainable development scenario that the EIA has, the share of low carbon investment would need to rise to 65% by 2030 from today's share of 35%. And to get there, it needs a significant step change in policy focus it needs new financing solutions at the consumer and the bulk power levels. It needs faster technological process, progress. You need more R&D. You need a huge sustained spend on the energy grid. Think about that. It's not what you think when you think about it. If, you, if you're paying attention to energy, you think, oh, my God, the growth is in renewables. And they're going to meet the – everyone's racing to do it. But you know, the thing I love about investing, it all comes down to math. The thing I love about uranium, it all comes down to fourth grade math. You just got to put the mosaic together. In 
2018, like I said, the global energy investment remained relatively stable. It was $1.8 trillion. And for the third year in a row, you saw power exceed oil and gas. Net additions and capacity were flat. And costs fell in some technologies, which makes the overall spend less. Energy efficiency spending is stable. Investment in coal supply increased 2%, right? Dirty coal. Think about that. You think coal is dead. King Coal is dead, right? <clears throat> if you look out over the next 20 years, coal as a percentage of energy production, of power production, will be lower. And volumes will be flat. Why? Because of demand growth in the rest of the world, in the developing world. So if we think about regional spending of the 1.8 trillion, China is the largest market for total energy investments, about 375 billion. The US is second at 350, Europe 200, Middle East a little over 100, Russia 100, India 80 billion, Southeast Asia 75 billion. But in, in, in India is where we've seen the most growth over the last three years. And not surprisingly, China, the U.S., and India are driving the investment trends. More than $2 in every 10 investor in energy goes to powering Asian economies. Another $2 divides between oil and gas and power in North America. The U.S. is responsible for most of the growth in energy supply investment this decade, with increases in both oil and gas, obviously supported by the shale, and in the power sector. But you've seen oil and gas spend slow down a little bit in the past three years, even though it grew strongly from 2017 to 2018. But energy efficiency investment has declined. China's lead is narrowing, but spending is increasingly driven by low carbon electricity supply and networks. But total investment declined a few percent over the last three years due to lower spend on new coal-fired plants, which is down over 60%. Energy investment in the European Union is down 7% over the past three years. But the share of spending going towards low-carbon energy has risen to nearly 60% of the share. And energy efficiency has been the lone growth area for spending. Renewables power spending has slowed. Mainly, I mean, you've got falling costs. But it accounts for over 80% of generation spending. In the Middle East, investment is down by a fifth the past three years, one of the largest declines globally, and it's huge retrenchment in oil and gas spending. And if you look to see the landscape and you look at it, you say, wow, okay, where's this money being spent in terms of share of the population versus current income levels? In the high income level, 42% of 2018's investment was in the high income level. That's 16% of the population. In the upper middle income, 44% of 2018 investment spending of the 1.8 trillion was in the upper middle income, which is 41%. In the lower middle to low income, 14%, which is 42% of the population. But as the EIA points out, a shift towards lower income segments is needed because there's a strong link between income levels and energy investment. Nearly 90% of energy investment, as I just said, in 2018 was concentrated in high and upper middle income countries and regions. I mean, because they tend to benefit from relatively well-developed financial systems. So what are the implications of today's energy trends? You talk about the sustainable scenario. I told you right now, you need to see a big improvement in in spending on uh, on renewables to get that six to get to their sustainable plan. So really, what you're seeing is energy investment is misaligned with where the world needs to be heading, and it's way out of step with where it needs to go. If you look at the IAE scenarios compared with the average annual investment required for 2025 to 2030, total energy supply needs to step up significantly, even with changing costs, declining costs. For fossil fuel supply, the lower levels of oil spending seen since 2014 
need to come down further to be consistent with the sustainable development scenario, i.e. the Paris Agreement. But it even falls well short of what's needed in the world of continued strong oil demand, which it is in the new policy scenario. For gas supply, today's investments fall way short of the levels projected in both the sustainable development and the new policy scenario. For coal, the opposite is true. The current spending exceeds the levels required by the late 2020s in both scenarios. And a shift in spending is required on the supply side, but it also needs to rise for demand. Energy efficiency and end use play increasingly play increasingly important roles in transport and heat. And those sectors are responsible for 70% of final energy consumption over half the global CO2 emissions. And there's a lack of policy attention given to these areas, point to a broad need for more focus and activity. So you need to see a step change in policy focus. You need new financing solutions. You need technology progress just to get even remotely close to the sustainable pathway. But all you hear in the press is talking about climate change and the Paris Accord and how everyone's doing what they need to. But there are investment implications. There are companies that can benefit, companies that will get hurt by that. And that's why over the next several weeks, we're going to start going sector by sector. And that's how we're going to that's how we're going to start to take uh, start to to look through the energy landscape. Uh, I have a little special guest for you today, though, and it's um, somebody who, on Twitter, uh, has gained a nice voice, and uh, he's come out of the shadows, and he has um, he has uh, emerged as a nice voice in the nuclear power space. He happens to work for me. Uh, at, at Sachem Cove, uh, and his name is uh, Tim Chilary, and uh, I thought we'd have some fun. Uh, Tim's in the office uh, today uh, from from uh, from another East Coast city that he lives uh, and works, uh, but he's in here visiting uh, visiting uh, uh, Ground Zero of uh, <laughs> of the office, uh, not Ground Zero, but he's visiting the office. Um, uh, of where where our nuclear brain trust uh, occurs, um, and so I thought we'd bring in Tim and uh, uh, we were joking around before I started the podcast, and we were talking about. Uh, I said, hey, "Hey, what are the things that make you go Ugh, that 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 uh, that get him frustrated when he's on Twitter?" So, Tim, just say hi. Good to be here, Mike. I will have you know. Uh, uh, I I had Tim uh, bring his hockey equipment and skates uh, because uh, there is uh, for the next two weeks uh, every day we'll be playing hockey uh, and uh, so I said if you, if you don't if you don't bring your equipment and, and your in your sticks and your skates um, just don't bother coming so <laughs> actually you said that I was going to be fine so. <laughs> so I figured I might as well round up the gear and uh, bring it on up uh, prerequisite. Uh, hockey. Um, so anyway, so look, there's a lot going on right now in the um, in the uh, uranium space, and and Tim has uh, uh, brought his presence to Twitter, and um, you know we uh, once in a while I see I, I I'm I'm on I'm on Twitter I'm at footnotes first on Twitter, and I I tend to uh, I've I've gone more silent uh, over the the last several months because uh, I I just can't get engaged in. I don't have the time or the inclination sometimes to to go back to ground zero. I've I've put a ton of information out there, uh, and I'm happy to engage uh, with with anyone um, on many things. Um, but uh, there's a lot of information. People, if, if people take the time to do a little bit of due diligence rather than just wanting to shortcut everything, um, I'm happy to engage. Uh, but sometimes I I just uh, uh, you know, the day gets busy and I, I don't, and, and Tim has really, uh, the last few months come out and, and, um, I, I watch as I see him go back and forth with people and I, I, I know Tim very well and, uh, and I could see when he's getting a little, uh, he's getting a little hot under the collar. Uh, so I, <laughs> I said, you know, Hey, let's, let's do a Tim, what are the things that can make you go, ah, so anyway, so there's a lot of stuff going on in nuclear power right now. I mean, overall, I would say that, you know, we're, we're very pleased with the demand trends that we see. Uh, 
uh, we we think there is a material shortfall right now in the market. The market would think that there's a, you know, a few people would say that there's a shortfall also, uh, but I think consensus would be uh, based off of uh, <clears throat> looking at WNA and UXC numbers that there's there's still a, a surplus in the market, which we think could not be more wrong. We think it's dramatically wrong, and we think the market will come around to that uh, in a period of time. I mean, our modeling that goes out through 2030 uh, has uh, and, and it's easy to see 20 million plus to, to, to 40 million pounds of, of, of deficits. And, uh, and, and we're, we're not rocket scientists. We just do fourth grade math and apply, um, country by country level analysis. Uh, we apply a commerciality thinking to it though. Uh, we apply a commercial, we look at these things through a commercial lens and what is in supply now and what is going to come out of supply because who finances these things? You know, one of the things people uh, who finances these projects, one of the things I think it gets lost on people who are looking at this industry. And again, it is a very small por portion of the energy industry. It's it's opaque. It's very complicated. Um, it's got so many layers in the fuel cycle that are all interconnected. And so it's a mosaic of information that has to be put together. And um, <clears throat> so when you think about these various layers, you can't just say, okay, what is on the drawing board and what's going to go into production? What's going to stay into production? You have to look about where, who finances these things. And if we look around the world and we look at what comes out of uh, Kazakhstan at 41% of global production and, uh, um, uh, and, and the Kazakhs are half of that, and then you have the joint ventures that are there, and then you have, <clears throat> uh, you look around the world at the state-owned entities that people think could produce at lower costs. Um, we would, uh, and they, and on paper they can, um, we think there's some spending, uh, that needs to be caught up to be done to get to those levels. But, but when you, you've got to put a mosaic of information together. And, and so we look at that, we look at all the regions of the world where uranium is produced. We look at all the reactors, we take draconian assumptions and we still feel there's a meaningful deficit, uh, which is in disagreement with, with what consensus is and time will tell whether or not we're right or wrong. Um, uh, but we feel, we believe strongly that there is. Um, but one of the things that I was talking earlier in the podcast about the mosaic of information when I was doing for-profit education, but that translates into anything. And uh, one of the things where I, I tend to not engage with, with folks is somebody comes at you with one piece of information about something, whether it be U.S. reactors or whether it be what's going on in Japan or whether it be what's going on with some snippet of information they heard and then drawing conclusions from that when nothing can be further from <clears throat> having an impact uh, in terms of one specific thing. It's a, it's a mosaic of things and you have to plug those into your models and understand when you plug and play, where did those come out? What does that mean to supply? What does that mean to demand, right? It's, you can't take one data point and run with it. And then you go down a rabbit hole and that rabbit hole doesn't help you solve the problem, which is, is there a surplus or a deficit and when, right? And, and um, so anyway, Tim, welcome. Good to be here. Um, so, so now, I mean, as you think about, why don't you give a little bit of your background first? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, actually when I was in high school, I was already uh, in the financial markets and following them. And uh, one of my peers, his, his father was, uh, he traded his own accounts uh, coincidentally from Long Island as well. And he was giving me advice and talking about things because I would go to him and ask him questions and this, that, and the other thing. And he said early on that if, if I ever wanted to go into the industry to, you really needed to pick whether you wanted to go in the commodities or if you wanted to be on the equity side of things. And um, for whatever reason, I always had an interest in uh, commodities, um, uh, which is a little bit un-American. You know, typically you find a lot of the, the uh, commodity-centric areas in the world, London, uh, East Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, obviously in Perth, Australia is, is another big one, uh, whereas Americans tend to focus a lot more on equities. So uh, even way back when I decided after I got out of college, uh, graduating in 2008, which was uh, kind of a, a, well, of course, a very interesting time with a, a great financial crisis coming, uh, but it got me an opportunity to go into the commodity market. So I, I started my career in Chicago as a futures and options broker, which was a wonderful experience because I got to spend so much time uh, day in and day out across so many different markets um, from the indices, bonds, agriculture, uh, metals, uh, 
um, energy all the way across. So I became very familiar, at least with a top level view of, of what was happening in those markets. So that's really where I started my career. And then I moved into the physical commodity trading business, uh, where I went to go work for a, a large physical global commodity trading firm called Olam International. And Olam uh, has always tended to focus on niche commodities. So where some of the houses that you may hear, like the Glencore of the world, focusing on whether it be metals or oil, uh, they focused on things like peanuts, almonds, cashews, timber, sugar, uh, things like that, where they could feel that they could get boots on the ground, as Mike mentioned, really understand that the supply chain and uh, develop that and, and have people working at, within all stops of the supply chain and develop views and be able to stay ahead of the curve and ahead of the market. And, and that was really their edge. Uh, so I, I went to go work in the marketing department in, in North America as, as a sales and trader for, for cashew kernels. And, and OLM was very, very smart in kind of what they did. It, and uh, having boots on the ground upstream, which is just a fancy commodity way of saying, you know, origin where they come from. Uh, throughout the, the processing cycle um, in various places around the world. Uh, and, and we would all communicate with each other. We would have once a week meetings uh, with people from, the, from uh, uh, the origin levels to the, to the factory processing levels, to the uh, sales and traders in the end markets across uh, Asia, Australia, uh, Europe, uh, Africa uh, and North America. So, so part of my job was to really understand my end destination market, the North American market, extremely well and feed information back to uh, the team elsewhere. And I did this for a number of years. And that's really where I, I think uh, the knowledge base of commodities and understanding the role of supply chains uh, and, and pulling back the mosaic and understanding Who's incentivized to do what? What's supply? What's demand? Uh, what are traders doing? Uh, what's the role of brokers in that in that market? Uh, who are all these people, and where do you fit into that cog in, in the wheel? Uh, so coincidentally, uh, the the training that I gained there and operating in physical markets uh, was a fantastic training ground for uranium. Because if you go and Google cashew kernels, you're not going to find very much information. Uh, you really need to integrate yourself in the market, uh, develop a Rolodex of contacts that, to speak to people, to understand what's happening at, at the various levels of the supply chain. Uh, so when I stumbled into uranium uh, way back in Q1 of 2016, it gave me a framework to operate from of, okay, Let's start looking, you know, uh, at the supply side. Let's start looking at the demand side. And fortunately or unfortunately, every question that I answered opened up about 10 more doors and 10 more questions. <laughs> so the, the list of questions grew uh, very quickly. Uh, but with that said, um, you hear Mike say it a lot. I've said it a couple times so far is really understanding the dynamics in the market and, and getting a sense of where all the pieces fit. And something that I, I jokingly say all the time is I'm just trying to learn something new, you know, one new thing every day, whether it's a small thing or a big thing that you can plug into that mosaic um, and it sheds a little bit more light. And that's what one of my, my first mentors uh, in the physical markets always said. It's kind of like entering a market. When you enter a new market, it's like a dark room and you need to be able to flick on some sorts of candles and, and whether they're large or small and and the the room will begin to get illuminated from that and so it's about picking all these points of interest uh developing them understanding them and as you do this day in and day out week in and week out um moving forward you'll look back in time and, and say wow I, i've learned a lot about this market and i have a much better understanding uh, but with that said you know you're always charging forward because you know markets are as we all know extremely humbling and uh, any piece of information could be the difference maker uh, between uh, continuing on with your thesis or recognizing that changes are happening. So that, that's kind of a, a pretty top down level of uh, my background, Mike. Great. So, Tim, uh, um, as you know, we have spent the last few years modeling out the uh, at least what we could find every source of supply, secondary supply. Um, Demand country by country, we go on a supply side. We go mine by mine, new project by new project, and we we analyze those and look at the reactors. Uh, 
as you as you look, and and you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we think there are significant deficits for quite some time. Um, as as you look and put your analyst hat on, what do you what do you see when you're interacting with folks and and you're hearing the other side of the story? What is it that that if you could jump up and down and say, no, this is what you're missing. I mean, what, what, what do you feel when you're looking at the market that the market is not yet appreciating? Um, I, I think one of the main points is that very few people have been able to dedicate enough time to putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, Mike has talked about it in the past, and, and I was in a similar situation because when I was beginning to look at the uranium market, I was doing something else. You know, I wasn't working at a fund where uranium was such a small potential position in a fund that you couldn't dedicate time to it. So Mike had the opportunity to spend time looking at it. I had the opportunity to spend time looking at it and kind of hacking around the jungle, if you will. Um, because of that, it's given us kind of being able to drill down deep into the silo and, and look at things on a deep level. And I think generally speaking, um, one of the first mistakes people make in this market is maybe they spend a few hours on it, maybe it's a day or two, and they think that they pretty much have a good handle on what's going on, um, when in reality it takes hundreds and really realistically to become an expert in this market you're really going on into the four figure level of hours to to understand all the pieces and, and i don't know that there are any experts i'm certainly not yeah <laughs> right it's you know certainly it's it's funny you know i learn something new every day you know you talk to someone new um and you get uh their experience of, of maybe running a mine uh, what you know somewhere in the world or a consultant who had worked on different properties in the past and you just pick up tidbits uh, of information and I, the number one thing without question is that they've read an article or they've read um, a view and in, in maybe it's a newsletter or maybe it's elsewhere or if they've put together a couple sources themselves and they say look you're wrong because the WNA is saying this, or a consulting group is saying why, uh, when, when in reality they haven't understood kind of the incentives of maybe some of those groups or something along those lines. But either way you dice it, the number one thing that I see is, is just a, a surface level understanding of the market uh, without doing the deep dive primary research themselves. Uh, and just an easy example of this is when someone is mentioning where data is coming from, it's typically being amalgamated from some source as opposed to saying, hey, I read this in this company's 10Q or 10K, um, or I was listening to a conference call of a CEO. You know, that's really getting down to the primary research uh, of some of these public companies where you can go through their 10Qs and 10Ks um, and read them from front to back and you'd be amazed at how much information is actually in there. And then use that as your starting point for when you go and contact people in the industry and understand uh, and, and stress test them and, uh, and apply a skeptic's eye to it to see what seems to be valid and what doesn't valid. Yeah, no question about it. Um, so, so yeah, I think for the most part, that's the main uh, number one thing. I think kind of a corollary to that, in a sense, is – just recognizing what your horizon is, you know, j just because Sage and Cove happens to be doing this doesn't mean that your time horizon is the same. Uh, your time horizon could be different from other investors in the market. So if you're looking to uh, be a part of this market for, say, six to 12 months versus 48 to 60 months, uh, different things will impact the market differently or, or say longer. Let's say, you know, your view of the market is, is 10 years that, that we could be in a potential positive bull market. Well, different items are going to influence your view uh, based on technology. Uh, it could be enrichment, changes in enrichment technology. Um, sometimes we hear, well, the, here's, a, here's a bear case on the market, but the, the technology that they're referencing uh, or the uh, uh, any anything that they're coming to us with might not be relevant on the horizon that we're looking at it. You know, if, if a technological feature in the market that could be changing 
affects it in say seven to 10 years or 15 years, that's just not gonna have any impact uh, or, or meaning to us um, if we understand what it is and we're confident that something cannot be uh, impactful in the market within the horizon that we're looking at it or, or, or is it going to affect supply? Is it going to affect demand in some way, shape or form? And so it just goes back to circling back again saying, hey, how does this affect our horizon? Does this affect demand? Does this affect supply? Does this affect or change the way uh, how utilities approach the market or how they procure in the market? Um, and just going over those questions a few times and thinking about it from that framework, I think will answer a lot of your questions that you may have about something and, and seeing whether it's relevant uh, to the market and, and, and how you view it. So those are the two main ones, I think, Mike. Uh, the uh, the thing that everyone's focused on right now is Section 232. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, you know, we've long held the view uh, that 232 is, is noise more than anything, and it has really prevented a major contracting cycle from starting. Um, but it really just seems to be Folk, I, I get calls from brokers in Australia saying, what are you hearing on 232? It's it's, it's the rumor mill of 232. Uh, I thought Brandon Monroe put out a good piece from Bannerman uh, a couple of days ago uh, talking about it. But if uh, we write about it in our in our uh, our letter to our investors, you know, we, we it's not it's not that uh, to us. It's not that important. But why don't you share your views on, on 232? It, it's only important from a it's not important to uh, global supply demand, but it's an important, uh, uh, from a contracting cycle standpoint. Yeah, sure. So, so without question, it's going to affect, uh, a con potential contracting cycle. Um, and when one of the, the items we see sometimes is that, well, it only affects the United States. You know, the reality is there's 58, 59 nuclear power companies out there in the world that are going to be buying uranium. So it's a very small pool. Uh, there's a decent chunk in the United States, of course, uh, with the U.S. being, you know, approximately, you know, call it, want to call it 25 percent of world demand or, or thereabouts. Um, anytime there's a trade action or something in a market that affects the end user of 25 percent of global demand, it's going to affect 100 percent of the market. Now, now, sh certainly there are uh, other countries out there, you know, you take the Chinese, for example, or other ones who are going to continue to buy no matter what. Uh, they need to continue to build their stockpiles, particularly when you look at what their demand will be um, in the ensuing 5, 10, 15, 25 years, because they take a very, very long uh, approach to this market. Uh, but, you know, 232 is really just the la for the last 17 or 18 months been something that has really slowed down the market's price discovery. Um, utilities, whether in the U.S. and globally, really need to understand how this is going to impact their procurement strategy. They really need to understand, is it going to change things in a meaningful way uh, where it changes our business practices? Uh, is it going to change where we have to source from? Are we going to have to go develop new resources uh, or new Rolodex of, of suppliers in the U.S. potentially uh, to meet uh, any potential trade outcome? So there's a lot of question marks and variables. And at the same time, I know there's been some other people in the industry that have hit on it as well. And that is the U.S. utilities have been extraordinarily busy uh, for the last six to 12 months, um, giving the information that the Department of Commerce has requested. So. Uh, more than anything, it's it's been something that has kind of just thrown a wet blanket on the market from a pricing standpoint. Uh, I, I think, again, going back to the horizon discussion, if you do have a horizon long enough, uh, this has been kind of a blessing in disguise because you know we're seeing the su supply curtailments uh, across the world. With the market sitting below thirty dollars a pound, you know, even call it thirty five, forty, there's just no real way some of these curtailed mines can even consider uh, coming back. So, if you are of the view that you think there are deficits out there uh, and they're meaningful and that they're going to continue, this really just prolongs that cycle uh, of that structural deficit in the market, and further, it pushes back any sort of real greenfield development uh, that could come to the market, particularly 
um, in the Western world or in, in a place that fully needs market prices uh, to exist. Uh, these are extremely long lead times for mines to come on. Even much simpler mines, uh, call them, you know, the, the ISR mines, the, the in situ recovery or, or sometimes referred to as the ISL mines, um, in situ leach recovery. Uh, while they have smaller uh, upfront capex costs to get going, these are still projects that need to be permitted, that need to be advanced, that need to be financed. So this, what this does is just pushes back any of that supply that could come online, uh, whether it be a curtailment or greenfield, which is ultimately positive for the price uh, if you've done the work and put together Mosaic where you believe that we are in these structural deficits, which we obviously uh, do think that, Mike. All right. Well, we'll uh, you got work to get back to work. <laughs> uh, back to the dungeon and back to cranking out some stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're going to continue the energy. I just wanted to, to touch on the geopolitics of energy this, this podcast. Now we're going to start breaking it down into different segments as we go. So have a good week, and uh, we'll talk with you next week. Thanks. The information presented on Talking Stocks Over a Beer is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.